So we are currently going through, rather I am going through an exploration phase of testing different whole milled uh, grains. We have a small mill at the bakery and uh, I'm trying to start a grain program next door where we actually sell some uh, whole berries of grains, couple that with uh, a program at Proof where we're going to actually start using these freshly milled uh, berries to make some bread. Uh, whole grain flours or whole milled flours, especially using ancient grains, bring a huge amount of flavor and a lot of different nutrition uh, benefits. So I have today rye. Uh, I milled this yesterday on the mock mill, so there's no sifting involved in this. It's just straight rye berries milled as finely as uh, my mock mill will allow. And uh, you can see a visual comparison between the rye and a bread that we've made before. You can take a look at another video on whole milled Coruscant. Uh, some people call it Kamut. Uh, so you can see a difference in color. And you can see how both of them stack up to a white flour. The rye has kind of a grayish color to it. And Definitely a different uh, smell, which is characteristic of rye. Uh, it, it tastes nothing like, uh, like the white flour. It has all the components of a whole milled uh, grain and has quite a strong, distinct flavor as a, as a flour. Rye doesn't contain as much gluten as wheat. Uh, historically, it was grown as a wheat alternative, so if the wheat crop failed, it was likely that uh, people in the various regions growing uh, could rely on rye. So rye has a rich tradition. There's many, many ways of making rye bread. We're making, I would say, more of a simple rye that still is predominantly wheat, but has a large component of uh, rye flour in it. Uh, we're going with that for the audience here, which isn't really accustomed to kind of the heavy, denser, full rye breads uh, akin to the ryes that you find, in, especially in Northern Europe or in general in colder climates. So I'm going to introduce my community soon to rye. We're going to be taking this up north to Northern Arizona markets this summer uh, to Flagstaff where last year uh, in that colder climate, people were asking for rye breads all the time. I'm excited to be able to satisfy that craving. We, from time to time, get requests for rye down here in the Phoenix Valley. It's a little bit more rare, but this particular rye will be for everybody. Uh, it will be approachable as a, as a rye bread. It will still have a lighter, uh, lighter air to it overall. And the key to that is um, introducing more water through a scald. Uh, so what I'm going to do to start is I'm going to put 500 grams or uh, half a liter of water. It doesn't really matter what temperature I'm starting because I'm going to set this to boil. Uh, I'm also going to up it by about 50 grams. So I'm going to go up to 550. And the reason being is, well, I actually tested this earlier in my, my uh, first batch, uh, which uh, will bake off in a little while. Uh, if you let it boil and then walk away even for a couple minutes, you lose tons of water to evaporation. So uh, I walked out to my garden uh, and this amount of water doesn't take very long to boil. I actually measured uh, how much I actually had. It was shocking to me how much had evaporated. So I'm adding a little bit more than I need to, throwing it on the induction burner and setting it up so that it goes to a boil. So once this uh, comes to a boil, I'm going to just simply pour it over uh, the, the actual rye flour. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that measured out into the bowl, my final mixing bowl. So I had a half a liter of the water. I'm gonna put 250 grams of the whole rye. That's about how much there is. So 
what's kind of interesting about this is if you just simply put water in with, uh, it, cold water in with this uh, whole meal rye, you would be lucky to get maybe 70% of the weight of the flour uh, mixed together uh, consistently with the water. But when you bring it up to boil the water, uh, what it ends up doing is uh, gelatinizing the flour. And so you can actually get one consistent whole where you get twice the amount of water than there is uh, flour by volume. It's a pretty neat trick allowing you to up your hydration in your final dough uh, in kind of a sneaky way. Uh, also, I think the other half of this, and, and this is not something that I fleshed out through reading or through sources, but through mostly through observation, seems like the scald and the gelatinizing of the flour softens these grains, which keep in mind contain the entire berry, the entire rye berry. Uh, as we've covered in previous uh, videos, those outer layers of uh, wheat berry or any grain berry are tougher. Uh, they're in nature designed to prevent water from getting in too quickly. So, yeah, seed drops on the ground and it's not meant to germinate right then and there. Uh, it's designed to take some time. Uh, there's this outer protective layer uh, in the bran. Uh, well, that layer is contained in this flour, and by gelatinizing it all, uh, my feeling is that I soften the final product so that by the time I combine it with my wheat flour, it's not doing as much cutting at the gluten. Uh, so those are the kind of two benefits. And notice that the, the mixture here is already simmering. It, barely got done talking and it already is. So hopefully I still have around half a liter. If not, I'm just going to simply put some more water in and get it done. All right, so I had a little bit left over. Not a whole lot. Had I walked away for just a couple minutes longer, I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have that buffer. So I just need something to stir this up. I guess that's one thing I didn't really consider in my tool set today. So I don't really feel like touching the boiling water. And you can see that coming together in one mass. This is called a scald. And it's really simple at this level. Uh, if you watch our video on Coruscant, you'll see it scaled up to a much larger batch. Uh, and that's a little bit more complicated to get right. Uh, takes obviously a little bit longer to boil a giant pot of water than it does to boil just a half a liter. So that took no time at all. And you shouldn't be intimidated by this method as a result. It doesn't add a whole lot of time. I have already tested the fact that you can actually prep this scald in advance because you need this to cool down now. It, it's quite hot. We'll get a temperature reading of it. So terminal temperature uh, of a sourdough starter, meaning the point at which the microorganisms die is about 130 degrees. Fahrenheit, this thing is temping close to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So the last thing I want to do is introduce this to Harriet, uh, which I've been working really hard to get ready for this, uh, for this mix. So instead, I'm going to let this hang out and move on to something else. If I hadn't had Harriet ready uh, to go, this would also be a potentially good time to refresh your sourdough starter and simply come back eight hours later. You can cover this with a kitchen towel. Uh, do this the night before, just like you can feed your sourdough starter, and then by morning you're ready to mix with it. Uh, it doesn't take that long to cool down this mass, and I don't need it to cool down to you know, refrigerate, refrigerated temps. I just need it to be reasonable so it doesn't spike the temperature of my final dough. So this is uh, 
This is my final mixture here. You can see that it's all one mass. You no longer see very much uh, remnants of flour. And that is what gelatinized rye flour looks like. This method is particularly used a lot in various rye formulas. Uh, and there's all kinds of ways of making rye breads, as mentioned before. If you'd like to check out a really awesome book on the topic, I really enjoy the book, The Rye Baker, uh, for, for all various uh, rye traditions. They're segmented by country uh, and by region. You can see how different regions have some similarities and differences in the way in which they make rye. You can see how the cultures uh, sort of influence rye. And you could probably dig a little deeper and understand why uh, the breads were made certain ways. Uh, you can see that uh, ryes in regions where wheat is really prevalent often are a blend of wheat and rye, whereas uh, rye breads in regions where rye is hardier as a crop than wheat is uh, tend to be more 100% uh, type, type breads. It's a very different experience eating a 25% uh, rye bread like this versus a 100% rye. And it's very difficult to get the 100% rye right if all you've ever done is make wheat-based bread. Uh, I would not call myself an expert rye baker, but it's something that I would like to add to my repertoire over time. All right, so I'm back at my scald and just kind of doing a quick temperature reading to see where I land. Looks like I'm in the very low hundreds, so about 102. And I'm not too worried about it. I have a lot more to add to this bowl. Keep in mind that this is a fairly small amount of dough. If this was a giant scald, and if I was making, say, 60 of these, I might still be a little bit nervous at this temperature. Although I know that by the time I add all the other room temperature ingredients to the mix, I'm going to end up closer to where I want to be temperature wise. And also because I'm only mixing a few loaves, uh, I know that the temperature is going to equalize to room temperature really quickly. I've got the perfect temperature in here right now. It's just that time of year where uh, it's kind of like Baker's temperature in here. So I'm not too worried at 102. It's not not warm enough that it's going to kill any uh, microbes. In fact, they'll just be uh, really nice and happy um, in the high 80s, I imagine, where, where they're going to end up. Uh, keep in mind that the mixer adds friction and also adds temperature. So if you keep the mix going long enough, you're going to heat up the dough again. These are all factors. I want the final dough to be in the mid 80s Fahrenheit. And I think that's about where I'm going to end up. I'm just doing a quick reference for my recipe because I certainly don't have this one memorized. I need to add 420 grams of or milliliters of water. I had temped this not too long ago and it was about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The water temperature is quite important. Now, I'm not doing any form of an auto lease in this dough, so I can literally add all of my ingredients to the bowl and not worry. This is my sourdough starter, Harriet. I always like to give her a smell and take a look. Looks like a lot of bubbles on the top layer, nice and active. I'm at 394. I'd say that's pretty decent. I like to use these dough scrapers just to clean up my vessel. If you don't, then the sourdough starter ends up drying out on the sides and it becomes a bigger pain to clean. Plus, you end up getting these dry flakes in your actual sourdough as they break off. So. I wouldn't recommend that. This is my, this is a type 85 uh, flour, meaning it's a whole grain flour, 
Uh, it has portions of bran and germ in, in it, but the largest portions of bran and germ have been sifted out. So it's a lot finer than the whole meal flour uh, that, that represents the rye in this case. And I need to put just shy of one kilo at 990 grams. For me, this is still an extremely small mix. It represents three loaves. And, uh, you know, if you're baking at home, I highly recommend that you're always making multiple. For one, uh, it's fun to share your work. And for two, it gives you that much more practice. Uh, it, it's not that difficult to find somebody willing to uh, take a few loaves of bread, uh, or a loaf of bread, rather. In this case, I'll have two extra uh, from this particular batch. So my other two ingredients that I have in this formula are salt and honey. And uh, I need to add 27 grams of salt and 24 grams of honey. I'm going to start with the honey. This is a raw, unfiltered honey, although uh, still nice and pourable. You can see that it's starting to crystallize, and that gives you a good indicator that it is a quality honey. If you have a honey that doesn't crystallize, that's a good indicator that it's not pure honey, that perhaps it's cut with agave syrup, uh, cut with water, cut with all sorts of things that, uh, that allow it to not crystallize and also give the person producing the honey a much higher yield. So even though it might seem like crystallized honey is a bad thing, it actually represents a good thing. And the crystallized component is quite nutritious. I need the 27 grams of salt now. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm actually going to weigh the salt out on this little lid instead of putting it directly in the bowl, because I, I certainly don't want to oversalt my dough. I have a recent bad memory of that, not that it was oversalted in measurement, but we were making hot cross buns at the bakery not that long ago. I wasn't, but uh, somebody was mixing them and actually mixed up salt and sugar, and it was 2,400 hot cross buns about $600 in the giant mixing bowl in ingredients alone before labor. Uh, and if you mix up salt and sugar in a dough that's a sweet dough, uh, it's certainly not a usable dough for anything. Uh, take one taste of it and that's all you need to uh, you know, be sick to your stomach in more ways than one. Uh, that was a difficult experience, especially considering that it was the second failed batch in a row. Uh, the night before, uh, somebody had mixed the same batch and hadn't put the sourdough starter in. And in this case, the sourdough starter added a ton of the moisture content to the dough. They didn't put it in until the very end. And so what ended up happening is as they were, they were mixing, uh, if you ever mix a really stiff dough without enough water, you'll notice that the flour actually clumps together in these really dense dough chunks. And there's nothing that you can do to get those dough chunks to dissolve back. Uh, so we could have either served chunky uh, hot cross buns to our customers who were expecting you know, a nice uh, holiday special or remix. So really expensive mistakes at a scale of 2,400. Would not recommend. Uh, I did the third mix all on my own uh, because, you know, I was it, it just, there's too much at stake at that point. And unfortunately this year, I don't think we made any profit on the hot cross buns. Uh, all the profit went into those first two bowls plus all the labor. So unfortunate, but goes to show you can definitely make mistakes. And uh, with salt in particular, you want to be careful. It's better to just measure it separate. I've done that as a habit all along, and it's served me well. So I have all of my ingredients now. I'm just going to run through and make sure that I got everything. Uh, in my bowl, I have the rye scald. I added the water first. I added Harriet. I added the salt and the honey, and I added the type 85 flour. So I'm good to go. 
I'm going to start this mix on the lowest speed, which on this KitchenAid is just stir. And it'll be really interesting uh, for everybody to see how the scald just becomes a part of the dough as though, uh, as though it, it was always like that. Uh, on its own, it's extremely sticky. Uh, but in a couple minutes here, it's just going to be one with the dough. So whether you're working on a small mixer, a large mixer, whatever, you always want to start your mixes slow. Uh, and get all the ingredients worked together before you notch it up a little. There's really no precedent for bread baking where you should be using a really fast speed on a KitchenAid. Uh, there's 10 speeds here. I only use the bottom half of the, of the speeds for bread making. The higher speeds are good for whisking, uh, you know, making like a whipped cream, that kind of thing but they're uh, not so great for, for bread making. You'll actually tear at the gluten. So all my ingredients are now uh, together so I can notch the speed up a little. I'm in stir right now, and this is uh, number two, and that's really all I need. I, that's three, that's about the max that I would do for bread making, but this is enough of a speed with enough weight in the bowl that it's knocking my mixer around and I don't really need to mix it that fast. Two is plenty. Nice, nice rhythmic mix. I want it here for, for about 10 minutes. I didn't do any auto lease, didn't do anything to develop my dough ahead of time with time. So I want to give it some nice development before I take it out of the bowl. I don't want to see any shagginess. I want a nice smooth surface on the dough before I take it out. So it's going to be here a minute. And while it's doing its thing, I will take care of my sourdough starter really quick. And it's just a good habit as a sourdough baker to do is to refresh often. I'm going to keep this one pretty small. 300 milliliters of water. 150 grams of the sourdough starter. I ended up a little high. There's 150. And then I'm going to match the flour to the water content at 300 grams. And this is a white flour, white bread flour to be specific. And I'm just going to do a quick hand mix here. It's quite fast to refresh a sourdough starter this small of a batch. This is basically now my home batch of Harriet. Although I'm not going to lie, I get a little lazy sometimes and just go to the bakery and grab some new starter. So it's all come together now. I don't feel any more flour. That's all I need. I'm going to spray off my hands and then just clean that up a little. In six to eight hours, this starter will be mature again. And because I've been taking good care of it, it will likely be even stronger than this batch that I already have. So this, at this point, you could consider discard. And it has a lot of uses, by the way. We haven't done any kind of footage on that but makes a good batter. Uh, it makes a good thickening agent in soups. Uh, you can add it to cookies. You can, you can do a lot with discard. I've made apple fritters with discard. So at some point we'll have to do some, some footage on how to use discard because at home you're always going to have this uh, type of problem unless you're really, really precise. At the bakery we we do have that level of precision where we know just how much we need for every given day and there's really very little waste. But as a home baker, it's a lot easier to produce little waste. So I want Harriet to be out on a counter uh, at room temperature here for the majority of the time. Uh, at this small quantity, I would really want Harriet at room temperature for at least five to six of the hours before I start to chill uh, for storage. Uh, 
otherwise it'll never really quite get going, the sourdough starter. And so by the time you pull it out, uh, it, it will not have risen. Uh, so I like to give it a bump and then cool it down so that by the time it's cooled down, it's mature and kind of trapped in that maturity level. Dough's still looking pretty shaggy over here, so it's not quite done with the mix. It is nice once in a while and professional to turn your mixer off and just scrape down the edges of your bowl just in case there's any portions of the dough that have uh, gotten stuck to the edge. That's how you can ensure that you're using all of your dough. This bread that I'm making today is actually quite similar to uh, the bread that I fell in love with in Poland that uh, probably was the reason for inspiration for me to even become a baker. There's this uh, loaf that was a portion rye and mostly wheat that I bought near my parents' home in Poland uh, in a big round. And we would take it, take it back to their place and, uh, and eat it while it was still a little bit warm uh, from, from its bake because it was so large. And uh, that loaf of bread in particular was what had me on the hunt uh, for good bread nearby. And uh, after one such trip to Poland was when I finally uh, discovered proof uh, as a customer at, at, the, at one of the farmer's markets. And about a year into being a customer for proof, I learned that uh, the original owner was moving away. Uh, that was on a Saturday. And by the following Wednesday, I was showing up to his house with the intention of taking the company over, learning how to bake for the first time. Two weeks after that, I was on my own. We were in here, just in this old part of the garage, and that was the start of our journey. None of that portion is documented here on YouTube. The first few years was the craziest. Uh, I, I wish that we, uh, we had it documented on YouTube, but it is all documented pretty well on Instagram, so you can go back to our feed and uh, read through a lot of those captions to see some of the, the challenges and learning that we faced at the beginning. Uh, nowadays, I am focusing on developing a team of bakers that in most cases really didn't bake uh, sourdough bread before joining us and uh, sort of reliving the same thing from a different perspective. It took a lot of, conf like a lot of confidence in myself to just keep going when certainly I wasn't a very good baker in the beginning. I didn't know a whole lot. But, you know, even as a not very good baker in the beginning that didn't know a whole lot, uh, still producing bread through this old human tradition, long fermented bread, it was still bread that you couldn't find in our community here. And so uh, the community around that purchased from us in those early days uh, didn't know any better. Uh, they loved the bread that we were producing. They thought we were just fine as bakers. Uh, that was really nice because it gave us the time to develop. And you know, eventually we did become pretty good at what we do. I say we because I've never truly been at this completely alone. Amanda's been by my side since day one. And uh, it was shortly thereafter that we started bringing on help uh, we've had many teams since then, but every single person that's come through our door has influenced us in one way or another. So uh, proof is the sum total of all of that energy input into it. And it's amazing. Uh, if you had asked me five years ago uh, whether right now uh, we would be uh, doing the kinds of things we're doing uh, at the kind of scale, I, I would have thought, you know, it's crazy. Uh, even when we first knew that we had to build all these additions to this garage, uh, we knew we would need to, but we didn't know how we would financially or, or what it would look like to scale up uh, to that level. So it, it just goes to show, you know, if you stick with it, uh, you can make a lot of interesting things happen. We're actually now exploring whether we ought to start buying flour by the full truckload in order to save money on shipping. Full truckload of flour is 17 pallets. Uh, 
I remember the first time we bought one pallet of flour and how crazy that was to buy one whole pallet of flour. Just insane, uh, you know, what a few years can do. Uh, just like out in the garden, when you see the videos of uh, the mulberry tree, you know, it starts out small and it grows a lot each year, you know, exponentially. So you can now see that this dough is starting to take on a little bit more of a smooth characteristic. Uh, it's quite a bit, actually, of dough for this uh, little five quart, uh, really kind of maxing out this uh, little five quart mixer with uh, just three loaves of bread. And for me, that's kind of strange because I'm, we didn't make bread uh, on a mixer like this. We were hand mixing when we were mixing at scales like this. Uh, there's something nice about having a mixer at this scale, but you know, I was never just baking for my home. And this actually takes more time than hand mixing uh, at this scale. If you don't believe me, uh, I talk a lot about that in the sourdough by hand uh, video that we uh, just recently released, uh, where we're only making a couple loaves of bread, uh, but it's hand mixed. So you kind of get to see a little bit of a variance here. Uh, in fact, I made a similar bread except with a different grain at scale not too long ago. And you can see all the nuances in the various different scales. Everything is ultimately the same. I'm still after the same temperatures and times, but I have some different considerations if I'm using a mixer, if I'm mixing by hand, uh, or if I have a big batch. And uh, for those of you that mix on these five quarts, you might be better than me at them, and that's okay by me. Uh, I'm definitely a little bit more accustomed to working with my giant ones. I can see that the dough has already developed a nice smooth layer. It's not really shaggy anymore. Uh, and I'm not really getting a whole lot of action right now. So the dough is just kind of clumping up on the top. I'm going to see if I can make a couple adjustments just to keep my mix going a little bit longer. And all I'm going to do is just free the dough up from the bottom. Rye has a tendency as a, as a flour to produce really sticky doughs. The more rye, the stickier it is. It's a tricky flour to use in that regard. Uh, I don't really want it so stuck to the bowl that it uh, takes away from the mix quality. I, the last batch that I did was only two. And I will say that two loaves mix up a little bit better than three. This isn't terrible, but I think I'm just pushing this mixer a little bit to its limit. You can see that just by making that small adjustment, it's grabbing onto the whole of the dough a little bit better uh, and still developing uh, the portions of the dough that need it. Whereas prior to unsticking the bottoms, I was getting this top to kind of spin like this and the bottom was just stuck in place. I imagine it will slowly end up like that again, but that's all right. I don't need too much more mix time. If I really needed to, I could probably call it a day right now on the mix. If anybody has any helpful tricks on the small mixers, feel free to leave them in comments. How do you get the, how do you get it from to, to mix more like it's doing right now as opposed to just spinning around in circles at the top. I think it's really a factor of how much dough I have in this bowl coupled with the fact that it's a rye flour. It's a little bit of an improvisation, but I'm gonna add a touch of flour, or a, sorry, a touch of water, as though I'd be doing a bassinage. Just kind of curious to see what happens here. Now I've split my dough in two. That's all right. Eventually that flour is going to work its way in the dough. It's going to get just slightly wetter. And as a result, it should move a little bit more freely in the dough, in, in the bowl. Right now that top portion is just skating on the bottom portion that's uh, a little bit waterlogged. When you add water like this at the very end of a mix, it's called a bassinage. I didn't do this in my first batch, my first test batch of this nor did I do it in the, uh, the course on loaves, but this is a practice that we use pretty standard in our, uh, in our wheat sourdoughs. And so already uh, that water is incorporating, 
and now I'm grabbing onto that dough a little more. But I am getting a little bit better action overall. So typically when you think of sticky dough, you think, oh, add some flour. On the table, I would say you're spot on. Add some flour on the table, get it out on the outside of the, of the dough. It'll be a little easier to handle. In the bowl, yes, more flour would lend itself to a less sticky dough, although more water will kind of lubricate the bowl and let it, uh, let it mix a little bit easier as well. I'm not really trying to dry this dough out, uh, although it would certainly make it less sticky. I just know from my past of working with rye flour in particular that it really doesn't necessarily matter how dry or how wet it is. The dough is just stickier in general than wheat flour uh, doughs are. So in this case, doing the bassinage, uh, I wanted to free up the dough that was kind of sticking to the bottom a little. Uh, and I might end up with an overall stickier dough coming out of the bowl, but at least to finish out the mix, I created less friction uh, and I'm able to finish out the mix fine. So I, it's mixing really nicely now. Uh, really have no problems with it at the moment. And so I'm just gonna let it continue for a little while. The one thing I should be careful of is just uh, getting a gauge of temperature. In the bakery, because of the auto lease process, I rarely mix this long. But my temperature is really nice right now. Uh, I'm in the high 80s. Looks like still going up. This is not like an instant read thermometer. It's kind of a slower one. Uh, but 87, and I'm fine with that. My final dough temperature for storage, meaning for the bulk ferment, should be around 84. So you want to overshoot that 84 degrees Fahrenheit because by the time I take it out of the bowl, it's going to start dropping pretty quickly in temperature. The mixing action now looks really nice though. And I can tell that the dough is still a little shaggy. It's not ripping, uh, which is the telltale sign of, it's not fully developed yet. Uh, there's a difference between over mixed dough uh, that starts to look shaggy because you start to see tears in it and dough that still is shaggy, meaning you can see that the dough isn't super smooth yet. Uh, and that's a clear indicator for me that I've still got a little bit of mixing to do to, uh, to get it a little smoother. So probably just a couple minutes longer. All right, so at this point my mix is uh, pretty much done. And you can, you can see it, like you can see that I'm now developing these strands of gluten. You can, if you take a closer look, you can see that the dough ha is made up of all these strands. And if I push, push it much further, I will start to potentially tear at it. Uh, also, the more developed it is, the more friction uh, in the bowl and the faster that temperature rises. I was already at a nice temperature, so no need to push it further. Keep in mind, I'm gonna come back and do some stretching and folding to develop the dough fully. And so at this point, I'm going to cut my mixer, drop the bowl. I'm gonna let it relax in the bowl for a moment and just simply spray off my tool while I let it relax. It'll be a little easier to handle. Funny, I said it was easier to handle, but uh, that's really something that applies to bigger batches because I'm going to end up just scraping this entire thing out in one go. I'm very used to having to cut dough out of a bowl for, for several minutes. So in this case, I'm just going to take my plastic dough scraper and loosen up the dough. Rye is not as strong as wheat, but you can see that I still have a pretty nice developed dough that can practically pass a window pane or get very close. That's nice for a whole meal uh, rye flour uh, in here, coupled with a whole grain uh, bread flour. So pretty happy with that development. 
don't really need more than that. The rest of it will just finish up uh, over time. So now I want to protect this temperature. Be mindful of your environment. Again, this particular environment right now is kind of at a perfect temperature for making uh, bread. It's not going to drop below a threshold that um, would stop fermentation. So I don't have to really worry too much. I can just leave it out. And I'm not really going to come back to this dough for at least an hour now. Uh, in about an hour, I'll check it and uh, do a stretch and fold. So just set it aside, clean my bowl, and then move on. So first of at least three folds, I'm going to give a quick temp reading of my dough before I get going. I just want to understand where I'm at. And looks like I have a really nice temperature in this dough. It's currently temping still in the high 80s. Looks like it's going to even out at about 88. Uh, I like that. I would like it to kind of coast down to 84, ideally. Uh, actually, looks like 87 and a half degrees. Pretty happy with that. So mixed pretty warm. Had 90 degree water, had that 105 degrees scald, and then everything else was room temperature, which is probably high 70s in here right now. We had a pretty long mix. So first fold is typically the weakest fold. Uh, here we go. Not used to folding the small amount of dough. Typically when you're folding the small amount of dough, just kind of go in a circle. Helps to have your hands wet if you don't want to stick to the dough. I'm not too worried about it. And I'm going to give it some more tightening, just, just like a pre-round. And now put it back. So there's a fold. Uh, what I'm doing is lengthening the gluten strands uh, and thus creating more of them, uh, making them stronger kind of stretching them to their limit and then letting them relax, stretching them to their limit again uh, in the interest of developing dough strength. I always like to also pay attention to how much volume of my container I'm taking up so you can kind of take a look at how much volume there is. And next time I come to fold, I should see an increase in volume because this dough should be rising. So that's all there is to folding. I'm going to have to spray off my hands uh, and move on along. All right, we're on to the second fold here. So dough's grown a little bit in the container. It's a good sign. Take it out. And I'm going to basically fold it into itself in the center. Once I make my way all the way around, I will do a quick pre-rounding action to tighten it back up. Plop it back in. See you in another 45 minutes for the last fold. So I need to do my final fold on this dough. Final meaning the third one. It's feeling pretty nice. Still needs some time though before I should shape it. Temperature is holding up really well, which um, I'm most happy about. Sometimes it's really nice to have a little bit of moisture on your hands to fold dough. A little bit easier to handle it that way. And each time I fold it, I can feel that the dough is getting a little bit stronger. All right. So that's my last fold. I'm going to let this go for another hour or so. And then uh, I will divide it up into the final loaves. Uh, at that point, the loaves can go in the fridge overnight. They can cool down slowly and be ready to bake. Uh, tomorrow morning. 
So we have been at this for a few hours now. Uh, this this uh, rye blend dough has been bulk fermenting. Uh, it's risen quite a bit in its bowl versus, or in its uh, Cambro versus when we started. Uh, I'm probably not going to refrigerate it right away. I'm gonna let it hang out for a little while before I chuck it in the fridge, probably another hour. Uh, this batch is moving a little slow. I'm using my intuition uh, and knowing that if I cool it down too quickly, it's only three loaves and uh, there's nothing else in the fridge. So if I put it in the fridge right now, the temperature is going to plummet and I might not quite get the rise that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna let it hang out, but it's certainly enough to shape. Uh, you could call that a bench rest uh, if you didn't actually put it in uh, the Bannetons, but I don't really see any reason not to put it in the Bannetons, to be honest. Uh, so we're going to divide this up into three loaves, uh, 800 grams a piece. Now you can, if you've seen a lot of our videos, you can probably tell the color on this is different. Uh, the smell of rye in particular is, uh, is very different. Uh, the smell of the finished loaf is really nice. Uh, rye brings a whole nother set of flavors. I, it's a related grass to wheat, but it's a completely different grain, technically. Uh, it has a different nutritional composition, uh, certainly a different set of flavors and a different set of traditions. Why bake with rye or any other grain other than wheat? Uh, I think the, the reasoning would be numerous. Uh, for one, the flavor aspect. Uh, trying something different, getting different nuance and flavor, but in a more practical way, uh, looking, looking at things like biodiversity uh, in particular, uh, if we just grow all the same crop all over, that's called monoculture, and it's not so good for the soil or for the planet in particular, uh, Rye, as I mentioned early on, has been a crop that has been a hedge against wheat. So in various regions in the world, if the wheat crop failed, which used to be a common thing, uh, rye would be the backup. Buckwheat is another example of that as a backup grain. And so I think it's really important to embrace some of these other grains uh, and the various traditions in them because you never know. Uh, we live in a pretty uncertain place uh, these days. Uh, sometimes it seems like the world is getting less certain with time, not more. And so you never know when you can look at a less certain past, a less certain history, and learn from it. Uh, of course, beyond you know, kind of the 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 negative, there's a ton of traditions surrounding rye. And there's no chance that you would mistake it for a, a loaf of bread that doesn't have it. Uh, lots of bakers use small amounts of rye in, say, baguettes to add a, a huge amount of flavor. A little bit of rye goes a long way to add flavor. As you increase the rye content, the difficulty increases along with it in terms of baking. Uh, rye doesn't contain as much gluten. but. Uh, I really enjoy it for all the reasons stated. I, I think it's an important thing to, uh, to preserve various bread making traditions, not just in rye, but to look at you know, all the various ways in which people have made bread, given that the world has not always been so globalized and different grains grow uh, at different levels in different parts of the world. So certain parts of the world, it's a lot easier to grow rye than it is wheat. Uh, certain parts of the world it's easier to grow wheat than it is to grow rye. Uh, if we keep uh, the diversity uh, and traditions surrounding various uh, bread making techniques, we can be a more resilient uh, group of people uh, because if something fails, we have another alternative. Plus, uh, by doing this, we learn about different uses, different cultures, uh, when you go into, say, 100% rye, the way in which they're consumed, uh, for instance, in Scandinavia, there's this uh, tradition called s'mores broad. Uh, I'm probably saying that wrong and butchering it. But basically, 100% rye loaves 
where you spread a little butter on them and then all the various pickled ingredients that are very common in uh, Northern Europe in particular. Not something that you see in the southwestern United States very often, but a whole different kind of cuisine based upon this particular grain. So as I mentioned earlier, this version of a rye loaf is kind of a intro to rye, if you will. Uh, a rye that I think the wheat lovers will appreciate for its various flavor, uh, but uh, there's, more, there's more that you can do with it. And uh, over time, I hope to have a chance to explore uh, some of the various rye traditions out there, as well as some of the traditions surrounding other grains. I'm going to shape this loaf um, similar to how I shape my sourdough loaves. It has a different texture to it, but still shapes nicely. Uh, you can see that the dough is holding its form well. Uh, in fact, rye loaves are usually pretty, uh, pretty easy to shape, aside from the fact that they are sticky as all get out and really challenge your baker's hands. I don't want to overstretch this guy. Uh, I'm going to grab some rice flour. And again, we use the rice flour for the purpose of creating a, a moisture barrier so that we can then store uh, the loaf seam side up and not worry about the loaf sticking to the banneton. Uh, if you ever use regular flour, you might find that by the time that you go to turn your loaf out of the banneton, it, it actually sticks to the banneton and you can ruin all of the work that you've done up till this point. Quite unfortunate given we've been here for a little while and we've been at this for a little while. So the last thing I want is to ruin my work over something as simple as choosing between rice flour and wheat flour. And I speak from experience. We didn't have rye flour in the bakery when we first started. Not really sure why. The original owner told me about it, but he didn't have any in stock. And every day was a challenge getting the loaves out of the banneton. So if you're struggling with that, try rice flour if you have access to it. If you don't have access to rice flour, an alternative, even though it doesn't always look as nice, is just wheat bran. Wheat bran in nature is designed to protect uh, the inside of the wheat berry from excessive moisture, and thus it performs quite well uh, for, the, for this sake too, protecting the loaf from, uh, from sticking to the banneton, creating a moisture barrier. You can definitely tell that this dough doesn't have the stretch of a wheat sourdough. I can't really push it as far without tearing it. Uh, and that has to, a lot to do with the fact that there's just not as much gluten in, uh, in rye. It's not non-existent, but it also, it also uh, the matrix of gluten in rye differs from that in wheat. It's just a much looser uh, connection, if you will. So I have these shaped. They are going to then fill out these bannetons overnight. As I mentioned, I'm going to keep them here uh, in, in a form of a bench rest for a little bit little while. I still got other things that I'm working on in the background and so I'm not going to throw them in this fridge for another hour or so. I want them to get uh, this bench rest uh, at room temperature where they can still continue to rise and fill out that banneton a little. So I'm going to measure it based on the banneton. So I'm going to take the loaves that have been uh, cooling down. They've already been shaped and they're cold now, uh, and just give them a little bit of a final proof at ambient temperature before baking them. My oven is already getting warm, and I'm going to let these guys just hang out for about an hour. Uh, this will help the momentum of that rise that I want in the, in the oven. They'll uh, start to rise out here again. Uh, and kind of finish their proofing cycle. I'm doing this just knowing that I put them away into the fridge a little bit young uh, for the sake of time. And 
that's just a reality sometimes when you're baking, whether you're at home or wherever. Uh, as much as you want to follow the dough, sometimes you have some hard constraints time-wise, and you can make adjustments as a result. The dough is not going to do a whole lot of rising in a cold fridge once it's come down to temp. And so I'm going to let it uh, out for a little while before I throw it in the oven. I don't want an underproof loaf, and I'm kind of playing it safe. This is a trial. I, again, I've actually never made this bread before today, so uh, this is the first time I'm baking it. So uh, that's, that's why I'm doing that. And you can do that as well if you judge that the loaf just needs a little bit more time to rise before throwing in the oven. As you bake more bread, you kind of get an idea of when you can bake the loaf for it not to be under-fermented or under-proofed. Ah, back at the old deck oven. Really love this oven. Kind of miss it, to be honest. Uh, it's one that you can operate with one human very effectively. Uh, it's still super efficient. Love that it's on casters. Love how easy it is to service. You know, our, our new oven at the bakery is beautiful and uh, not complaining about it at all because it's a wonderful oven. But there's something to be said about these guys. If, uh, if I was to build like a warehouse bakery, I would probably just get multiple of these uh, as opposed to multiple of those. Uh, there's something very efficient about how to operate this oven. You can get into a really nice continuous flow uh, with these four decks. So it's heated up. I've got the top up to 450. I've got the bottom, uh, the stone, uh, at 420. I've set the steam at eight seconds. And uh, I want to make sure that my damper is closed so that I trap the steam in. I'll set this little steam valve here where I can gauge the pressure. And because I haven't used this oven very frequently, I'm just making sure you know, the steam is loaded in. Uh, once I load the, the, the bread, I uh, can't really go back. So mildly nervous about the bread because I haven't baked this bread before. Uh, I think it's gotten a decent amount of, uh, of rise. For me, it might be a little bit under overall, but hopefully uh, fermented enough. Uh, so I'm going to turn these over. This oven fits 12 loaves per deck. I only have two, so quite overkill. I can spread them out. I'm going to put some rice flour atop. This is just for looks. As I do the scoring, it will uh, bring out the scoring more. This is not a necessary step by any means. I'll spread the rice flour evenly. And then I'm going to take my wire monkey lom and do my ornamental scoring first. So we'll do a simple wheat stalk. followed by the functional score on an angle all the way through the loaf. <laughs> In nature, uh, rye does definitely look a little bit different, but, but they have a similarity. They still have that, that seed head. Uh, I think you'd have to know what to look for to be able to really differentiate them. And if you know what to look for, it'd be pretty obvious to you. Uh, but I imagine that you could probably confuse a lot of people uh, because they're both grains. Uh, the, the seed head looks somewhat similar, uh, but they, they have their differences. They, they grow at different capacities and volumes. They grow at different heights. Well, there's many different varieties of wheat. Uh, there's also different varieties of rye, not quite as many. Uh, wheat has definitely been cross-hybridized a lot more. So, I'm going to load this guy into the middle, close up the oven, engage the steam. That's solid. That's sound. I'm just going to play this like I normally play my sourdough loaves. Rye often likes a little bit longer bake. A lot of times you drop the temperature after the first couple minutes, although this is still primarily a wheat loaf. So I have to kind of keep that in mind. 
So we'll play this test round like we play the sourdough. 20 minutes uh, with steam in this particular oven and then a steam release uh, to finish. Uh, and if I mess up on this first bake, so be it. This is a test for that reason. It's not, I'm not making 100 of them, I'm making two. Uh, I'm going to eat them myself. So, and that, that should be a word you know, to people baking at home. You know, take some risks, use your gut instinct when you're trying something new, and know that it's probably going to be pretty enjoyable bread for you either way. Uh, and you learn even if you make a mistake. In fact, you'll probably learn more if you make a mistake. Uh, just make sure to be aware of what's going on. So I'll be monitoring the sky a little bit, uh, but we've got 20 minutes before I need to release the steam. We'll see how it goes. Oven's yelling at me. It's time to release the steam. Both loaves have a pretty nice ear. I'm going to release that steam valve. Just kind of take a look at where we're at. I'm excited to try this bread. Now to finish out, I'm going to set another 10 minutes. It's a little bit ambitious. I'll drop that top temp so it's no longer actively heating, but rather sort of coasting downward. Uh, to avoid burning. And I'll come back once it yells at me again. All right. Because I don't normally bake this bread, I am going to actually stick my thermometer in it and make sure that it's fully baked on the inside. Glad I did. Still has a little ways to go. Not much. It's temping in the high 170s. My guess is that if I give it another three minutes, that's all I'm going to need, and then I can pull them out. A fully, loaf, a fully baked loaf of bread should be a little bit over 200 degrees coming out, although if you pull it over 180, it typically finishes out without an issue. I've yet to have a raw loaf on the inside pulling it at 180. Uh, that's when I, when I first started five years ago, that was kind of the temperature we pulled that back, back at a time where our oven was so inconsistent that we really needed to temp uh, the loaves. Uh, but 170, I get a little bit worried, especially given the whole meal and whole grain content being a little more dense, uh, worried that the inside might not quite be there yet. So giving it that extra couple minutes should do the trick. All right. Quick check. My guess is we're there now. Oh yeah, so now I'm clocking well over 190, still climbing 194, and climbing. I'm pretty comfortable pulling these out of the oven at what looks like 198 degrees. They're still going to end up heating, uh, rising in temperature a few more degrees to the finish line with no problem. And they turned out nice. I really like that color. The question is what's the inside like? For that we're going to have to wait. So I have my finished rye loaves. Really excited. I'm hungry. So I'll get out so I can't wait to try this. Now, I want to clarify, these probably should use a little bit more time cooling. Uh, you really want them to cool all the way. If it was even more rye, it would be more important. Some people don't cut open their 100% rye loaves for literally 24 hours because it's curing that entire time. These are nowhere near 100% rye, so I'm not as worried about it. Looks like, looks like a solid crumb on the inside. This is the edge piece. Uh, I'm going to cut in the middle just so you can see kind of the full 
crumb. I'm pretty happy with it so far. Really nice. Uh, for rye, nice and airy and open. You can see that still could use a little bit more cooling time, uh, but overall I'm really happy with it. Can't, can't wait to try this. I'm going to try this end piece. Hmm. Might be my new favorite bread. It has a beautiful smell. It's a nice crust and a really beautiful taste. Like, uh, hard to describe, but tastes, you can definitely tell uh, that there's something in here other than just wheat. It uh, has almost like an oat, oatmeal type taste to it to me. Um, really pleasant. I just want to keep eating it. Yeah, really happy. Can't wait to get this on the menu. I'm not even sure that I would change a thing. <laughs>